Pretend you're watching your local news and the weather forecast comes on. You might see live feed from a sky cam, maybe a Doppler radar scan, but you'll most likely see this, a weather map with temperatures or fronts or areas of high and low pressure. Most people might look at this and think, okay, cool, I'm right here and there's this vertical wall of cold air that's right behind this blue line and it's gonna move here tomorrow and it's gonna get cold instantly. That's an exaggeration, clearly most of you probably don't think that, but not a lot of people realize what is actually going on in the vertical, in the most mundane of weather situations. So today I want to explain how meteorologists think about the atmosphere vertically, and how looking at all the different levels of the atmosphere are useful for determining what the hell is happening up there. In the same way that you would take a slice of cake instead of eating the entire thing. Maybe that's not the best analogy. In the same way that you would slice up a, a big task and do a bunch of smaller tasks, meteorologists find it useful to sort of chop up the lower atmosphere into a bunch of different levels. We could do this by height. You could do the first 5,000 feet and then the next 5,000 feet. The problem is that height isn't really that useful when it comes to the math. There are certain equations that govern atmospheric dynamics, which I might do a video on later, and it turns out it's more useful to chop up the atmosphere based on pressure. Pressure is a very interesting thing. It's the amount of force per unit area. Air molecules have a weight to them, so naturally gravity pulls them downward. So the closer you are to sea level, the more air molecules there are, the higher the pressure most of the time. This is why people get altitude sickness in Denver. Not only is there less oxygen there, there's also just less air in general. Pressure is measured in millibars, and sea level pressure is roughly 1,000 millibars. As you go up in height, the pressure actually decreases, so it's fairly easy to chop up a pressure level, take the data on that surface, and then throw it onto a weather map. But here's where it gets interesting. These pressure surfaces aren't exactly flat because pressure doesn't always decrease with height, or it does decrease with height, but at different rates depending on where you are in the world. You might have a surface low with a high above it, or vice versa. So the pressure surfaces actually look like this, wavy, hilly, jagged, and sloped. And that's totally fine. We can still mathematically take the data from this surface and throw it onto a map. In fact, we can even take the heights of the surfaces and map those so we can tell where the highs and the lows are occurring at that specific level. By the way, we get this data by just launching weather balloons with weather instruments attached once every 12 hours or so at different locations across the US, and then we map it. So we successfully chopped up the atmosphere into surfaces and we have data for all the levels that we chose, but there are still so many variables. What are we looking for? How do we choose what variables to use? What's useful? And the answer is a lot. Meteorologists look at dozens of variables, and in some cases they've even combined multiple variables into indexes that kind of decrease the amount of data but retain the useful information. I'm going to go through the seven charted pressure surfaces and the most useful data available on each surface. First is the surface map, which plots all the weather data taken at the surface weather stations, which are usually near airports. This includes data like air temperature, wind speed, dew point, relative humidity, cloud cover, rainfall totals, and many others. It allows us to identify surface highs and lows, as well as warm and cold fronts. These are useful for observing current conditions on the ground anywhere in the US. Next is the 925 millibar map, which is roughly 2,500 feet above sea level. A lot of the western US is over 2,500 feet, so the data there is non-existent. Personally, I don't find this map very helpful most of the time, but there are some situations where it's actually useful. The 850 millibar map is roughly 4,700 feet above sea level. This map is very useful in determining warm or cold air advection. Warm air advection just means that warm air is moving towards a place. And fun fact, uh, the biggest advection is actually the advection of my bank account uh, to my student loan provider. You can also see convergence and divergence of air, which just means air flowing towards a common point or air retreating from a common point. The dew point depression shows the moisture content in the air and it's very useful for determining severe weather outbreaks, among many other things. But again, Denver is higher than 4,700 feet, so we're still missing data there. The 700 millibar map is roughly 9,900 feet above sea level. This is kind of the in-between map that doesn't really get a lot of love. It's considered the top of the lower atmosphere, 
and oftentimes more information can be derived from the maps above and below it. But if there's a system that's vertically skewed, the 700 millibar map can sort of fill in the gaps as to what's happening above 850 millibars. And having a map every 150 millibars allows us to determine the depth of things like highs, lows, and moisture. And again, some of the peaks of the Rockies are still taller than 9,900 feet. The 500 millibar map is about 18,000 feet above sea level and is incredibly useful. It's great for determining wind shear, which is the turning of winds with height, which is a key ingredient for severe weather. You can also identify ridges and troughs. Ridges are the result of warm air building up towards the poles, and troughs are the result of cold air dropping down towards the equator. If you're looking at the 500 millibar map, they're really easy to identify. You can also view vorticity, which is a measure of the local rotation of a fluid and very important for severe weather situations as well. The 300 and 250 millibar maps are just above 30,000 feet and are useful for observing jet streaks and Rossby waves. Jet streaks are bands of air moving very fast through the Rossby waves and intense weather can occur thousands of feet below them. Using all these maps together, we can sort of get the, the picture of the vertical structure of air masses moving across the country, which is regrettably something that the viewer of a local forecast never really gets to see. For instance, cold fronts are actually sloped in the vertical. The leading edge of a cold front is closer to the ground and it lifts the warm air upwards kind of like how a snow plow pushes snow up off of a street. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share. I'm trying to build a community here of people who want to learn more about weather but are really turned off by the math physics and overall meteorology jargon. I mean, when you have people dropping things like the quasi geostrophic equation, you know, that's, that's a lot. And I want to try to boil that down so everybody can kind of learn more about it without being overwhelmed. I'll see you guys next week. Peace.